everyone, my name is Alexis Dearman. I am the head of class for the Ida B. Wells Honor Society. I want to start off by welcoming you to our second annual lecture in honor of Ida B. Wells, a researcher, journalist, and activist. Next, I want to thank our sponsors for contributing to this event. The Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office, the Office of Inclusive Excellence, Minority Clubs United, Black Student Alliance, Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library, Mary Baldwin College for Women, Samuel and Ava Spitzer Center for Civic and Global Engagement, Martha S. Grafton, and the following departments, Philosophy and Religious Studies, History, Political Science, World Languages and Culture, Sociology and Anthropology. Tonight I have the honor of introducing you to Paula J. Giddings, the Elizabeth A. Woodson 1922 Professor Honorata of Africana Studies at Smith College, who is the author of four books, When and Where I Enter, The Impact on Black Women on Race and Sex in America, In Search of Sisterhood, Delta Sigma Theta, and the Challenge of the Black Sorority Movement, Burning All Illusions, an anthology of articles on race published by The Nation magazine from 1867 to 2000. And Ida, a sword among lions, Ida B. Wells and the campaign against lynching. Ida received the Los Angeles Times Book Prize in biography, the Letitia Woods Brown Book Award from the Association of Black Women Historians, and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. The work was deemed one of the best books of 2008 by the Washington Post and Chicago Tribune. Dr. Giddings is a journalist and former magazine and book editor. She joined Smith College in 2001. She served as the editor of the Meridian's Feminism, Race, Transnationalism, Nationalism, a peer-reviewed feminist interdisciplinary journal that provides a form for the finest scholarship and creative work by and about women of color in the U.S. and international context. That is housed at Smith and published by Duke University Press. Giddings has a, been a book editor at Random House and Howard University Press. A magazine editor and Paris bureau chief for Encore, American, and Worldwide News and a journalist who has written on national and international issues for the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Philadelphia Inquirer, Jane F. Freak, the International Herald Tribute, and The Nation, among other publications. Dr. Giddings has been awarded honorary doctorates from Wesleyan University, Bennett College, and Howard University. <coughs> she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2017. We are honored to have you here today. Please help me to welcome our speaker for the evening, Dr. Paula J. Giddings. Thank you so much. Oh, you look wonderful out there this evening. I'm so glad to be here. Uh, thank you, Alexis, for that um, wonderful, generous introduction. And congratulations to you uh, for being head of class and of the, and the Ida, Wells, Ida B. Wells Society. Thank you, by the way, last night I came in very late, and what was waiting for me in the hotel room with this wonderful uh, basket of fruit and crackers and cheese from the Ida B. Wells Society, thank you so much. In fact, today I didn't have to have breakfast or lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so, but <clears throat> what it signifies also is very moving to me, thank you so much. Uh, when Dr. Tillerson Brown wrote to me about an annual uh, lecture, Ida B. Wells lecture, I said, I'm coming, I'm coming. Uh, 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 I spent a lot, of, a lot of my life researching Ida B. Wells, and I'm thrilled that uh, you would uh, have this lecture here at Mary Baldwin, and uh, thank you. Also, I've uh, made a new friend, I hope, with Dr. Andrea Cordette Scott, um, who helped to initiate this uh, project. And uh, I, I so appreciate it. I had a wonderful time, a very 
very short time that I've had here. Um, sometimes uh, subjects choose biographers, and I feel that about Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells sort of came to me when I was writing about other women, and she saw it and she said, look, these other women are important, but I'm the one. <laughs> I am central. The things that you want to understand, and <clears throat> let me take you by the hand and show you my life, and you will understand a great deal about America if you if you hang with me. <clears throat> and that, <clears throat> excuse me, that's exactly uh, what I did. Um, uh, uh, if you want to understand about race, and gender, and class, and the intersections of them, and how one lived, not only talks about it and thinks about it abstractly, but <clears throat> lives that life, then you read the life of Ida B. Wells. And it's a very complex life, and there's a lot of facets to it. Uh, today, I thought, since we're on the eve of the election morning, uh, I would talk about how to be well specifically uh, and her relationship to women's suffrage and the vote. Um, we don't often get a lot of good history about black women and women's suffrage, you know, partly because of the origin story of Seven Falls, where there are no black women present. We have a kind of warped, I think, sense of who were the leaders in women's suffrage, and particularly who and, and, and the role, particularly, of black women in, uh, in suffrage, and the intensity of black women's relationship uh, to, the, to the vote. Uh, just a, but just a, a, a slight advertisement before I get to the substance of my talk. People talk about the women's vote uh, in the sense it's like it's a, like it's the progressive vote. But the women's vote is only progressive when you do, when you think about the black women's vote. The majority of white women voted for Trump. Uh, in 2016, uh, 2020, uh, it, yet, uh, so it's only when you really bring in the black women's vote that we're talking about a vote that uh, 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 is the vote in which the highest proportion, the highest turnout of any demographic group is the black women's vote. Uh, and uh, 2008 and 2012s, it helped get Barack Obama elected. It was the black women's vote that was the margin of victory for Doug Jones when he became senator uh, of, of Alabama. It was the black women's vote that was largely responsible for the wave that won the House of Representatives in 2018. And uh, I say this not talk about this not just as a aha moment, but we have to understand our electorate, and we have to understand uh, the aspirations of black women in doing so. And the legacy uh, of this activism uh, is longstanding. And I mean, Wells is one of the reasons why we have this history. So let me talk, I'm going to sort of do this, <clears throat> talk about Wells and talk about uh, suffrage in general, uh, women's suffrage and black suffrage in general through a, kind of through a story, through her life, and a particular story that many of you, if you, if you know anything about her life, might know through one instance of a particular incident, which was the, uh, 1913 March, the first National Women's Suffrage March, in March of 1913, of which Wells took part. So let me, without further ado, let me tell the story. On March 13, 
March 3, 1913, Ida B. Wells Barnett was in a Washington, D.C. rehearsal hall with a delegation of 64 Illinois suffragists. The only black woman in the group, she was representing the Alpha Suffrage Club, the first black women suffrage organization in Chicago, which she had founded two months before. The women had come to the march, had come to march in the first national women's suffrage demonstration organized by Alice Paul and the National American Women's Suffrage Association, now called it NASA, from here on in. It was rumored that Alice Paul, and this, is, and this march was a brainchild of Alice Paul, it was rumored that Alice Paul also was determined to keep black women from marching in the parade side by side with whites. Paul well understood how to make the parade a spectacle that could not be ignored. Specialists in putting on pageants were hired. Some 5,000 banner-carrying suffragists dressed in white from all over the country, would descend on Pennsylvania Avenue on the eve of Woodrow Wilson's presidential inauguration. Accompanying the women would be nine bands, four mounted brigades, 20 floats, and an allegorical enactment on the steps of the Treasury Department. Leading the parade, would be Inez Milholland, known as much for her striking beauty as for her political commitment. She would begin the procession riding astride a magnificent white horse. I think Beyonce would be jealous of this one. <laughs> By the year of the march, 1913, Wells Barnett, now 51 years of age, had been a nationally known figure for over two decades. She had first come to prominence in 1892 when she launched the nation's first anti-lynching campaign from Memphis, Tennessee. Made in exile from her home on the threat of death, Wells took her campaign across the country and twice to the British Isles. By 1895, she settled in Chicago, where she married Ferdinand Barnett, an influential newspaper editor and Illinois' first black state's attorney. I was so happy to be able to write about a happy marriage. <laughs> there were was, there was such great partners, and he was so supportive of the work. And she was supportive of his, but that's a whole other topic. Recently, Wells Barnett had become one of the founding 40 of the fledgling NAACP. She was also a member of the National Independent Political League, and in eight months hence, would co-lead his black delegation to the White House to confront President Woodrow Wilson for his racist policies. Wells Barnett not only brought individual star power to the Illinois delegation, she also brought the passion of a long legacy of black women's activism and involvement with the vote. We may be most familiar with the individual invocations of Sojourner Truth, but as historian Elsa Barkley Brown observed, during Reconstruction, this is Wells' uh, uh, grew up during Reconstruction, black women were enfranchised internally within their communities, if not in the electorate at large. They participated in public forums, parades, rallies, mass meetings, and even political conventions themselves. They were known to serve in some cases as armed militia to protect black men at the polls. In the domestic realm, it was also known that black women could be very opinionated about who to vote for. Uh, Frances Ellen Harper actually wrote a poem about this in, in, during the Reconstruction period, in which one stanza goes, day after day did Millie Green just follow after Joe, and told him if he voted wrong, to take his rags and go. <laughs> <laughs> no one in the Illinois delegation had been more active in 
women's organizations, and both black and interracial, than Wells Barnett. And in 1893, she founded the Ida B. Wells Club, the first organization of, Chicago's, of the Chicago Black Women's Movement. The club was also the first to become a charter member of the predominantly white League of, League of Cook County Clubs, where Wells Barnett became the first black woman to serve on this executive board. Indeed, in Illinois, <coughs> Wells Barnett had found <coughs> a vital group of white suffragists who had welcomed the exile upon her triumphant arrival in Chicago. Women in the state had been working for the vote since 1869, and, and in 1891 had won a highly contested right to vote in the school district elections there in Illinois. Three years later, Wells Barnett was part of the successful campaign of Lucy Flower, who was a progressive white reformer and founder of the Women's League of Chicago, a coalition of 57 organizations. Flower was elected as University of Illinois trustee, and thus the first Illinois woman to hold a statewide position. In the presidential election year of 1896, Republican women asked Wells Barnett to get canvass the state for William McKinley, who had spoken against lynching as Ohio governor. Ida had a six-month-old baby uh, at the time. Ida uh, also struggled a, a lot with activism and motherhood and domesticity. She had a six-month baby at the time, and this is how she resolved these things, and, and agreed <clears throat> to do so, to canvass the state, only if she was provided a nurse at every stop. <clears throat> Quote, I honestly believe that I am the only woman in the United States who ever traveled throughout the country with a nursing baby to make political speeches. <laughs> These activities parallel her work with the black women's suffrage movement. In 1896, black women, inspired in part by the anti-lynching campaign, organized the National Association of Colored Women, of which Ida was a founding member. By the time of the suffrage march, remember this is 1913, and the, N the NACW had a membership of 100,000 women. This is the first really black civil rights. This predates the NAACP, the Urban League, National Association of Colored Women. And by 1913, it had a membership of 100,000 and a national suffrage department, as well as longer standing suffrage organizations within its feder federation of state, city, and local departments. As Biennial Conference in 1912, the NACW passed a resolution in full favor of women's suffrage, in addition to protesting Jim Crow, segregation, and lynching. Uh, black women have always had an intersectional philosophy or idea about activism, not only suffrage, uh, and they were all connected, weren't separate entities. Okay. <clears throat> the perspective of black suffragists was clear. Quote, if white American women, with all their natural and acquired, acquired advantages, need the ballot, wrote the Alabama suffragist Adela Hunt Logan, how much more do black Americans, male and female, need the strong defense of the vote? Indeed, Wells Barnett saw enfranchisement as essential to her career-long campaign against lynching and racial violence. She had estimated that nearly 3,500 men, women, and children had been lynched between 1885 and 1912. Moreover, as attested by the vicious Springfield, Illinois riot of 1908, Mob violence was no longer limited to the South. As Ida would write in her essay, How Enfranchisement Stops Lynching, the alarming development showed that lynching was America's national crime, which required federal legislation and the election of officials who would enact it. People who ask, why should we vote? Why do we still need to vote? You know, these conditions aren't that different uh, than they are now. And the reasons to vote are pretty much the same. I well believed with, with no sacredness of the ballot, there can be no 
most sacredness of human life itself. In 1913, seven years before the passage of the 19th Amendment, the suffrage movement had been gaining momentum, recently winning victories in California and Nevada. <coughs> You have to remember that the women were get, got the vote in the West before the 19th Amendment, in many parts of the West. In Illinois, the stars were aligned for the passage of the Presidential Municipal Suffrage Bill, which Ida and others in the delegation had been working toward for decades. The bill would allow women to vote for presidential electors, this is Illinois women, mayors, aldermen, judges, and other municipal officers. If this partial, it's called a partial suffrage legislation was passed, Illinois would be the first state east of the Mississippi to have such a law and would make its artists, in, uh, activists, influential <coughs> actors, not only in Illinois, but in the national campaign for full suffrage. Now, Wells Barnett could envision African American women becoming a force in electoral politics where they could actually vote, and her idea was to center this power on the second ward uh, of the south side of Chicago, which was burgeoning at this point with blacks who were coming into Chicago and being kind of shuttled uh, to, the, to the second ward. Uh, and, and, they, and the second ward, however, despite the growing number of blacks, was represented by, by white politicians of the Republican machine, a machine that was corrupt, that was patronizing, and used patronage to stay in power. Wells believed that it would take <coughs> black women to break this cycle. And so she was anxious to have this bill passed and to begin operating. This is the reason why she, she created the Alpha Suffrage Club, to be able to do that work. Now, Willis Barnett had no doubt heard the scuttlebutt that the march organizer, Alice Paul, wanted black women to march in the back of the parade, Jim Crow style. Mm -hmm. Race had been a simmering issue since the passage of the 15th Amendment in 1870 that allowed black men to vote, but not women. Disagreement over support of the measure has split the suffragist movement into warring factions, the predominantly white suffragist movement, into warring factions that elicited racist retorts from the group led by Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, such as this found in their newspaper that they published in this period. Quote, as a celestial gate, gate to civil rights is slowly moving on its hinges, it becomes a serious question whether we had better stand aside and see Sambo <coughs> walk into the kingdom first. The, re the reunification of the factions in 1890, Wells Barnett knew, had not resolved the race issue. In fact, in 1894, she had been a guest of Susan B. Anthony in her Rochester, New York home. This was very interesting. You know, this is, these professors were, were, were complex. Susan B. Anthony was someone who less, more or, or less liked a great deal. Um, Susan B. Anthony supported Wells' anti-lynching campaign. Um, and Susan B. Anthony was actually one of the few whites, including white progressives and former abolitionists, who actually had social relationships with black. A lot of abolitionists, and because you had abolitionists, didn't mean that you liked black people. You were just against slavery. Uh, uh, she, is, she is invited into the uh, Anthony, and Wells is invited to Anthony's home. Uh, and then, but soon gets into an argument with Susan B. Anthony. Anthony wanted to marginalize African American women in the movement in order to gain Southern support for a federal amendment. Anthony characterized the strategy as mere expediency 
that would be rectified after passage of the legislation. Ida's retort <coughs> that the strategy would only confirm white women's segregationist views was, bor was borne out in 1903 when members of NASA, black members of NASA, were banned from the organization's national meeting in New Orleans. Indeed, while NASA made public and state statements against racial discrimination, indications were that it was willing to sacrifice black women to appease its southern members and politicians. Politicians like South Carolina Senator Bill Ben Tillman, who complained that enfranchising black women, who were the largest group of voters in the state, and who were known to be, quote, aggressive in asserting the rights of the race, end quote, would mean the end of white supremacy. Think about that. Think about that, they actually got the quote. Enfranchising them would be a disaster in his eyes. And a number of white suffragists, not all of them, but a number of them, uh, started to assure the Southerners that to sustain white supremacy, give educated white women the vote, it will help you to sustain it. As NAACP's Walter White wrote to the black activist and suffragist Mary Church Terrell, quote, if Paul, you know Alice Paul is considered such a hero, she's not. If Paul and other white suffragists would get the amendment through without enfranchising Afro-American women, they would. The racism of white women posed an additional burden for black women who not only had to fight against the same misogyny and apathy that white suffragists faced, but who also had to convince wary African Americans that women's suffrage wouldn't be more of a benefit to white supremacy than black empowerment. Quote, if white if women got the vote in America, the colored race would have suffered further ills in legislation Opine, the Chicago Defender, the nation's leading black newspaper. One wonders what Wells Barnett thought her Illinois delegation might do with the segregation order. Though she had worked with them through the years, and they had worked side by side with black organizations, she had recently chastised the ironically named Chicago Political Equality League for balking at the admission of black women within the organization. These organizations would work with black women, but not have them come into their own organizations. White women like themselves, Ida Wells told them, had to be emancipated from the prejudice which fetters their noblest endeavor and renders inconsistent their most sacred professions. This is what she thought of women's work. While the Illinois group was going over their logistics in the rehearsal hall, they were interrupted by Grace Trout, head of the delegation. Trout announced that one of the national organizers of the march <coughs> had advised her that the Illinois delegation be entirely white because many Eastern and Southern women had expressed resentment about black women marching side by side with whites. A debate ensued, but the final consensus was that Ida should not march with the group. If the Illinois women do not take a stand now in this great democratic parade, then the colored women are lost, Ida told them, trembling with emotion. In these words, Wells Barnett left the hall. <coughs> One reason why we have such a vivid picture of what's going on is because the uh, Chicago newspapers sent journalists to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the march and to observe the Illinois delegation. So we have, there's a very, there's a longer story in, in the press about the debate going back and forth and Ida's reaction. And I am on a first name basis with Ida, as long as I know. <laughs> when she was nowhere to be found at the start of the parade, 
Many of the group assumed that Ida had decided to boycott it. But as the Illinois women began marching, Wells Barnett suddenly appeared from out of the crowd and joined them as she had always planned. <laughs> two white supporters, two white supporters from the group, Bell Squire and Virginia Brooks are the names, rushed to position themselves on either side of her. And the three of them marched together in the Illinois delegation. As a Chicago defender who was once wary now said, observing this, Wells Barnett proudly marched with the head ladies of the Illinois delegation, showing that no color line existed in the first national parade of noble women who are in favor of equal suffrage. There is, despite the fact that there were many who wanted the organizers, black women, to work, to walk in the back. They just refused to do so, not just Ida. But you know, I think about this very much. 1913, of course, is the year also of the founding of Delta Sigma Theta sorority, whose first act as a sorority was to march in this parade. And there is a lot of misinformation, even recently, uh, newspaper articles that say that the women that not only the, the, the deltas but black women marched in the back. But we have evidence that this is not true, that they refuse to do so. Uh, in fact, uh, from the crisis, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois uh, noted that, uh, the, the, that despite all of this, again, despite the resistance, that black women uh, March, all march with their state uh, delegations without men or hindrance. You know, I think it's even an insult to even think that black women, who, some of them who, 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 who whose lives, they put their lives in their hands to, to, to vote and to register, and they will continue to do so after the 19th Amendment. But let someone, to, let them, someone put them in the back of a parade. No way, Jose. Mm -hmm. And someone like Ida Wells or Mary Church, everyone knows anything about Mary Church Terrell, marching in a segregated section. Uh uh. But how do we, how do we lose this history? Grace Trout, who I mentioned headed the Illinois uh, delegation, wrote about the march sometime later in an article published in the Journal of the Illinois State Historical Society. No mention of Ida Wells. Soon after the suffrage parade, the, the municipal bill, bill was won, and Illinois legislators in the state capitol were reported to have been awed by the sight of several hundred members of the Alpha Suffrage Club lobbying them against three discriminatory bills. All three of those bills were lost. In 1915, the black women's vote was the determining factor <coughs> in the election of Oscar the Priest to become Chicago's first black alderman. I was objective in getting down to Summers Club to have a black representative finally uh, in, on the south side of Chicago. In that year, the Alpha Suffrage Club also supported two white women independents running for county commissioners. The Alpha Suffrage Club, according to historian Wanda Hendricks, soon became the largest and most powerful black female voting bloc in the country. In 1930, a year before her death, Wells Barnett herself became a candidate. She was the first black woman to seek a state Senate seat in Illinois. The election was lost, but a legacy was gained. Black women had indeed become an electoral force in politics, and they still are. Thank you very much.
so much. I'm glad to be here. Good to see everyone. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. We're, didn't you learn a lot just now? And now we get to learn even more. Thank you so much, Professor Giddings, not just for the talk tonight, but for, for your work. We saw Ida showing up and when and where I enter, and when we see this here, it's like, yes, this is the definitive work on such a wonderful activist and role model. Uh, uh, we here, have here before us, before I get into the questions, members of the Ida Well Society, correct? Yes, and they're right there. And they're so happy to see you. Please stand. Please stand. States and particularly the South, 
And in their efforts and relentless determination is a heroic story uh, in and of, of itself. I mean, anyone who says, why should I vote? Boy, if you look at you this history, you would be ashamed of yourself if you didn't vote. Ashamed of uh, women Bethune holding back the Ku Klux Klan at, 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 the university, at her university in Florida, holding back the Ku Klux Klan to register to vote. So, um, uh, so, so yes, yeah, so, uh, and, but we also, also, uh, Amy don't know much about is what, not only what was happening nationally, but what's happening in these local cities. Now, you know, the m migration is not, in f not full yet, but there's black, blacks are beginning to really leave the South into these cities all across the country, including northern cities. And black women are beginning to mobilize in these northern cities uh, as well for municipal uh, power, which, which Wells was doing. So this is what she saw, that we have to begin to organize within Illinois, and specifically uh, in Chicago. Uh, Chicago, to say one more thing, uh, Chicago becomes, I mean, um, Carl Sandburg, the poet who wrote about, who used to, he was also a journalist who wrote about Chicago, said uh, in 1919, he said, Chicago had the most, had the most powerful uh, political, was the most powerful black political entity in the country. He said, he said for good and for worse, for both, right? Uh, but it was very, it was very, very powerful. Uh, because, partly it's because of the uh, Chicago, uh, it's municipally structured, that's another, issue. Um, uh, and it's no coincidence the legacy of this, and black women make it even stronger once they get involved. The legacy of this, it's, it's no coincidence that Obama comes out of Chicago politics. Right. That our only black woman senator, Carol Mosley Braun, comes out of Chicago politics. Um, so, um, and she is a part of that legacy that makes Chicago that's strong. Now, what, in, in uh, sh Chicago at the time, 13 is when women could vote in Chicago, right? Like municipal, uh -huh. for certain, for certain and, municipal offices. And so did Ida B. Wells, was she uh, championing a certain black person to run she for office at that time? She, she, she championed, but it's a very complex uh, s s story. But she championed, first of all, she championed she said, we have to have a black, she told the white machine, we have to have a black representative. I mean, it's time. And the white machine, because black women start registering, and it, the white machine became alarmed. And so finally, uh, uh, they said, but part of their organization, well, let's get a man by the name of Oscar Priest, uh, uh, and that's not, we will nominate him, we will let him uh, run. Uh, and then there was a lot, it gets very complicated a little bit after, after that because there's some other black independent men and all try to also become a part of the, of the, of the that election that will, that will give us the, the first black alderman. And Ida then has to step in and say, no, we can't afford to split among the, the, the blacks. So she really creates it in a way that Oscar the priest will win. Uh, and he wins by virtue of black women's vote. Just, just as, as, as is the case still contemporary. As, as it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, gosh, it just went out of my head. So let me move on. Oh, that happens to me all the time. <laughs> Virginia elected more black representatives during Reconstruction than, than we can count. We didn't start getting, we didn't get our, after Reconstruction, our mm -hmm. next black uh, elected official was L. Douglas Wilder for Lieutenant Governor in the, in the 1980s, right? But in Memphis, in 1880, Wells was just about the age many of you students are to, tonight. And in 1880, in Memphis, over 90% of the black population voted. And when they voted, civil rights acts were passed. 
When they voted, black people were elected to office. The Reconstruction Amendments we know were passed. Black schools and churches were formed. And as Du Bois wrote in Black Reconstruction, we see that blacks were standing a brief moment in the sun. In 1875, there was a Civil Rights Act that was passed that forbade racial discrimination in hotels, trains, and other public spaces. But eight years later, in 1883, the United States Supreme Court rendered the 1875 Civil Rights Act unconstitutional. That moment in the sun didn't last long. So finishing Du Bois's quote, blacks moved back again towards slavery. The 1883 Supreme Court decision basically legalized racial discrimination less than 10 years after racial discrimination had been outlawed. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Today, on election day especially, I'm sure you would encourage, as you've been doing through your talk, all who support similar political interests that you do, <laughs> and if you don't support those interests, I, I do hope that you, you stay home. Uh, <laughs> to, to, to uh, exercise the vote that Ida Wells fought so hard to secure. However, what do you say to students who are convinced that their vote really doesn't matter? What do you say to students who say that the very foundation that America was built upon historically didn't regard blacks as human, much less social or intellectual equals? What do you say to students who dare say the entire structure of American policy and politics is racist to the core, and the nation that has historically and contemporarily profited from the exploitation of black and brown people will never be treated equitably? What do you say to students who are equally as disenchanted by local politics as most politicians who, who are elected simply because they won't rock the boat? They may use their minority status to get elected, but once in office, they become the perpetuators of white supremacy in blackface. A lot of those students are sitting here, and those are the questions that I get. And, and I can say what I say, but, but you know, what would Ida B. Wells maybe, or what would you say? Now, we know that Ida Wells dies in 1931, so she doesn't have the benefit of all of the experiences, right, that, that we know about since then. But, even given that bleak analysis, how do you motivate students, especially this age group, to continue to put their faith in the vote? First of all, let me say that I empathize with the student feeling so this is a very difficult time to be your age. Very difficult time. There's nothing so much around you that is that is hopeful. There are lots of things that aren't hopeful. And it does sometimes seem that whatever you try to do, or whatever you think is the right thing, that it doesn't materialize and that it doesn't seem to make a difference no matter what you do. Um, I came up in a period which was a little different because it was on the edge of the civil, it was the big growth in the civil rights period when there was a great deal of hope and where there was a great deal of belief that we could really change the world. You know, I have, I have a young cousin who said, well, you're so lucky because the things you did, you did uh, in the civil rights movement, you know, it, it was something that seemed to change things. When we do something, it becomes a Pepsi Cola commercial, you know? I mean, it just it becomes monetized and commercialized and commodified. Uh, and there's, there's, there's difficulty. But if you understand history at all, you'll see and understand Ida Wells' life. She lived in a, in a period very much like this one. She lived in a period very much like this one. Where, where rights, she saw rights. Re, re, remember, ours is a history. No, ours isn't a history of never having. Ours is a history of things being taken away. And so she, she as a person, grew up in Reconstruction. You know, where there are black US senators voted. Uh, where her parents
words her father knew, who was the Secretary of Education from Mississippi, who was a black man, where, you know, black communities began to thrive. Businesses began to thrive. And then suddenly, a wave of disenfranchisement and of tremendous violence that t turned into lynching. Uh, uh, it was, and it was a time where, where there are disparities of wealth like that. It was a time of technological revolutions like that. This is a time of electricity and, and the, the machines for, for the presses and the newspapers, um, et cetera. So it's very similar, but this is what she understood that a lot of her contemporaries did, and this is one of the things she taught me, was that this country, the worst and the best happens at the same time. You can't say because there's progress that it's going to be inevitable <laughs> that the progress continues. This is why she had some struggle with some of her contemporaries, because they said, look at all the good things that are happening to us. You know, if we just behave, you know, it's the idea of respectability. If we just, if we just uh, uh, accumulate wealth and get educated and be good citizens, then first class citizenship is inevitable. But I would say the same time that that's happening, and we can see so similar things of, uh, you know, this is a period, first black five being the capital. First black woman on the board of education. Mary Church, terrible. In, in, in a big city, thriving, as I said, communities. Wealthy businesses. Uh, uh, but she said, but you know what else is happening? Lynching has increased. Segregation is increasing. Um, people are being, uh, neighborhoods are congealing into poverty. Mass incarceration starts. This period, this is the period of mass incarceration starts. If you remember the 13th, you know the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery said, ex with the exception of, of someone who was convicted of a crime. So guess what? Then lots of convictions start. And corporations actually buy labor, lease labor, it's called the combat lease system, lease labor from the prisons to do work for free for them. Same situation. But so she says, you know what? What this means is that you have to protest. It means that it, it, that that that, that this, nothing is inevitable. And so you just so you have to protest. And the things and that's the way things change. Uh, so 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 it's important to sort of understand that. And, and, that there, and there are these cycles, you know, that we just have to be, sometimes we're not, we don't understand them or don't expect them. But I could have told you, a lot of us <laughs> generation could have told you, after Obama there would be a Trump. <laughs> I mean, this is the way of the world. There's pushback. You have to be prepared for it. You gotta push it back. You know, but it is hard. <coughs> it is tough and it can be depressing. But there's a great deal, you know, I just, you know, and you know, I just, activism, I, I, I just stayed so optimistic that change was possible. This is the person in the middle of an anti lynching campaign who felt that it was possible. She is one of the few, and a number of her contemporaries really do become very depressed, who are, who are leaders. Yeah. Uh, alcoholism, there's a lot, there are a number of suicides of the leadership group. This, this period it was a very difficult period. But her activism sort of kept her alive and kept her, you know, the year before her death, she, in 1930, in the middle of the Depression, she says, I'm going to start a new newspaper. <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> you know? So, um, uh, so yes, so, so that's it, so that's it. Yeah, and I think you, the point that you made there is Ida B. Wells never just voted, right? You know, right? She, she voted, but she was also an activist. She networked, she reached across the line, she collaborated. So, so the vote is not 
the salve that's going to heal everything, right? And I think that that's what we also must keep in mind as adults, as, as young adults, uh, that while that vote is something we must exercise, it's not the end all and be all, right? There's work that has to go. You know, so I don't know how many did but they, I, I was talking to some, I was on another panel and I was talking to someone we talking about the vote. And I said, you know what, I want to start an organization called After the Vote. What do we do? I'm guilty of this too. I vote, and then I just, I don't know what my people I vote for are actually doing. I'm assuming that they have, because I voted for them, they have the same ideas, but I don't know that. So voting itself is only the beginning of the process, right? So there is another process that has to, <laughs> that has to continue. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, afterwards, holding people accountable and understanding what the issues are. And that's very, that's actually very exciting. You will have, if you understand, you know, part of it, the great thing about education is that and understanding certain things is that it no longer becomes like, like a personal thing. You, when you begin to understand the systems, then you understand how to work, how, how, it, how to, to, to then uh, break the systems apart and do what you have to do. And it's very empowering to, to really understand that. To deconstruct, that's the word I was looking for. To deconstruct those systems, you can do it because it's man made systems. So you can undo them. And it's your generation that has the, the, the intelligence and the energy and the future in front of you. Because this is your future, you know, I'm just about done. <laughs> but y'all need a quality of life. That's worthwhile. But you're going to have to make it for yourselves. I, I wonder that I have so many things going on in my head. One is the respectability politics piece, right? We look at pictures of Ida B. Wells, and she looks so dignified all the time, right? Even the pictures with the four children uh, hanging down around her. She's always well put together, it seems, right? Like she's just this pure woman who is just the, the picture of. Victorian respectability politics. But I don't think she was. Was she? You know what? She evolved. She starts off as being very respected, the respectability politics. This whole idea of if you live a certain way and do certain things, then, you know, progress is inevitable. And she. Before Frank Carter. Yes, this is before. And she also. Because it's important to know these people are perfect and they evolve and they are flawed and they recognize their flaws. This was also a period of time, you know, there's uh, urbanization, blacks are coming from the country into the cities, there's a lot going on. People don't know who some of these black people are. There's, there is crime. And so a lot of blacks and the, the elites think, so what is going Is there really, are they really raping white women? You know, that, that was the rationale. We can lynch black men because they're raped and white women. And some of them, including Wells herself, she says, I was wondering too, is this really happening? What is going on? Because they saw, and, but then she begins to realize that there is a, that black people are being criminalized. She never says that nobody committed crime, nobody ever raped it. But she begins to understand that there is a narrative <coughs> around black people and their behavior that is justifying violence. And she <coughs> says, you know, a lot of the elites say, Booker T. Washington used to say, no graduate of Tuskegee ever got lynched. You know, is it if you live a respectable life, that wouldn't happen to you. She begins, and a lot of, you know, people think about, well, Maybe they didn't do X, Y, and Z, but they did something they had in that kind of trouble. Right. So, but she begins to understand that there is a narrow, there is a narrative around black criminality, criminality, and stereotypes that are drawn, which we see now, which are driving uh, this this rationale for violence and for segregation and for all those other things. And she sees it through the lynching of Thomas Moss in 1892, who was a businessman, and he was the symbol of the New South, the blacks coming out of enslaved circumstances, uh, getting, he, 
wasn't that well, he wasn't that well educated, but he worked very hard. And he he owned co-owned something called the People's Grocery with with other city black citizens. This is part of the business uh, uh, that was really emerging in this period. So this is a co-op, right? Uh, and then, of course, we, we, I think you all know, you know the story. Uh, uh, but what happens to the, the, the people's grocery is threatened, he's threatened, there's a riot, he's put in jail, and then taken out with two other men, and, and, and then lynched. And I just says, he was lynched because he was successful, not because he was a great boy. <laughs> That's what she begins to understand. And, and those stereotypes that you were talking about, about black men, that kind of fueled this racist violence, was also uh, absorbed by the populace of, of black women. Uh, not, and, and can you say more about what she was trying to combat uh, with regard to the stereotypes of black women through formation of clubs and? I mean, right. There was the idea. This is the this is the period, late nineteenth century, which is the the, the beginning of, of a modern social science. Modern social science was very quite racialized, uh, and it's and, and what was very uh, challenging about it was that now I mean we now know that social that these uh, and they were coming out of Ivy League universities this racialized social science, and we now know that these these universities were funded, you know, by former planters and by others who wanted to justify uh, uh, certain kinds of treatment of black people and, and the, to prevent them from rising to a position where they couldn't be a good labor force for them anymore, uh, and where they competed with whites, just as Thomas Moss had competed uh, with this. So, so, so it's the beginning of modern social science. Uh, and what was, hor what was horrible was that now people could say, we have the evidence that blacks are inferior. We have the evidence that they are devolving to a state of primitivity. Uh, and this is why they are so lascivious and, 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 and hypersexualized. And the reason why men were hypersexualized it's because women are high, black women are hypersexualized. Because women are always see, you know, all that stuff around chivalry and protection of women and all that kind of stuff. A lot of that is there to regulate male behavior, particularly sexual behavior. That's all I'm about. But, and so if you're, if women were lascivious and amoral, then the men had no stock in. The men were, could be uncontrolled. And this is what was happening. And people assumed that anyone who had been enslaved, or history of enslavement, had to be lascivious and immoral because of the sexual oppression that went on uh, in, during, during the slave period. So when she begins to deconstruct the stereotype of black males, she's also deconstructing the stereotype And I'm sure you all have questions. Does anyone have questions before? I thought we would, so I'm gonna, all right. All right, so we're going to need the microphone. Um, if you just come here, you can pass it. If you have a question, please stand and come up to the back. Hello, Dr. Giddings, we met when you came in. Yes. Um, everyone else, I'm Chastity Ford. Um, so my question was about um, what was it like interviewing Agony Wells' daughter for um, research for the book? Yeah. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, her daughter is Alfreda Duster, who, uh, uh, when you see uh, Agony Wells' autobiography, it says that it's about Alfreda Duster because Ida Wells died before she could finish her autobiography. She was, she, was, she was writing it. And Alfred Duster 
that took on the project of getting footnotes, of organizing the material, et cetera, and trying to get it published. Ida died in 1931. Alfreda finished soon editing in, in a year or two and tried to get it published. Her autobiography, Ida's autobiography, Crusade for Justice, wasn't published until 1970. Publisher after publisher rejected it until John Hope Franklin, the great historian John Hope Franklin, the University of Chicago, had a series of black autobiographies. And he sees this manuscript and publishes it. And that's one of the only reasons why you even know a lot of Wells was, because of that autobiography. So, um, uh, so I, this was a, uh, I, as soon as I started thinking about writing the, or the biography about Henry Wells, I contacted my friend Duster, <coughs> whose sight unseen was so generous. Um, I'm just, I'll tell you one. And we talked about her mother, we talked about her, let me just give you one example of how generous, how wonderful she was, and, and how, but as I say, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. Uh, I asked her to write, uh, I was trying to get a, a grant from, Fort, from Rockefeller Foundation, and I asked her if she'd write a letter on my behalf. Simon C., we just talked, she never, we never met, but we just talked, and she said, of course I will, it's very nice. So we came very close to the time, to the deadline, and I just wanted to make sure everything, she didn't have any questions or whatever. And I called her, and the man answered the phone, it's her son, and he says, I'm so sorry, but my mother just had a stroke, and she's in the hospital. And, you know, I remember breaking down, and my condolences and all that, and well, three days later, I get a phone call. And it's Alfreda Duff. She says, Paul, oh, you know I had a stroke. <laughs> I said, yeah. She said, but I want you to know, while I was in the hospital, I told my son to come to the hospital with a typewriter so I would write your letter and get it out. <laughs> That's, that's who she that's who she was, you know. I broke down again. But, uh, but um, so uh, she was she was extraordinary. It was very there's an interesting story. She this is this this woman, um, Alfreda Duster, um, finished the University of Chicago in two years. She was pretty smart. And Ida Wells wanted her to be a lawyer. After she saw what Ida Wells went through, she said, mm -hmm. she says, I want to get married. <laughs> and I want to have children, which she did. <coughs> right? Uh, and uh, uh, she became a social worker. And as a result, you know, Ida was tough for me when it was early. Tanahasi Coates, uh, once wrote, he, he, read, he wrote, he, he read my book and he said, he said, uh, you know, I, I never want to date Ida Wells, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, she was a tough girl. So, uh, uh, and so they didn't speak for years, Alfred and her, her mother. Just to let you know this can happen and things can come back, back together again. They didn't speak for years. But the later years of Ida was well. They became closer, and when Ida died, and, that, and I said, you know, she died writing. She died, the, the, the autobiography ends in mid-sentence, so Ida was writing until the moment she died, succumbed. Uh, and Alfreda immediately uh, makes sure that Ida's legacy, you know, is, is, is the same, you know. You know. So, and I'm friends with her children.
children, uh, with I mean, Alfredo's children, um, uh, who I became friendly with as we and grandchildren, who I also know now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have two questions from online. Um, assistant Professor Mark Rath asked, what is your prescription for practical present day action to achieve needed societal norms and outcomes to further the legacy of I.E. Wells? Say so, that you put, tell me you know, so. now, you know I'm a history person. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> what is your prescription for practical present day action to achieve the needed societal norms and outcomes? To further to achieve, the, I'm sorry, immediate societal norms. Immediate. Yeah. Immediate societal norms. And outcomes to further the legacy of Ivy Wells. Hmm. You have to protest and know what you're protesting about. And be clear. I was very clear. And you can't expect everyone to be like her because she was really clear. You know? But she was a person who. When she saw something that was right thing to do, she just did. And one time she said, even though the heavens may fall, which they did around her a lot, uh, she never looked to the left or to the right at all. Now, not everybody can be that, but you can certainly recognize people who do it well <laughs> and work with it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, you need to organize. People, you need to organize. It's, it's not, uh, you need to organize have an objective, understand the world is more complex now. Uh, now I mean, not just that it was complex then too, but more complex than what I knew of the world of the, in, the, in the civil rights movement, for example. It's other things that are going on. You know, you know, black movements now, all of a sudden they get lots of offers for nonprofits, do all kinds of all kinds of stuff that sort of, sort of takes you away from what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, and so it's harder. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's hard to, to stay clear, and to stay clear what you're doing. Tony Morrison always used to tell me. She said, you know, you always have to keep your channels clear. You can do all kinds of stuff, but there's certain channels, there's certain things I won't do around right commercial around my writing or anything, because you begin to think about it. It's going to be, it's, it's, you're not going to be clear. You have to keep your channels clear. You have to understand what you have to do when you do it. I mean, it sounds simplistic, but it's very hard to actually do that. You know, but it's exhilarating when you achieve it. Thank you. The second question is, how can we learn from Ida B. Wells as we deal with election deniers? Election deniers, sorry. Election deniers. Well, she, she was the world of election deniers. You know, you know one thing? The, um, this, this, this election, and all this is new, of course. You know, the South has been, there have been elections that not new in the South since the Civil War. I mean, and before, you, you know, so uh, she would be, of course, she would have to say, you just have to, I mean, I don't know, I don't have anything profound to say except you have to struggle and fix it. And, there's now there's a lot of power in the in the we know in the in the, in the, in the black vote. I don't think it's organized that well. Somebody's got to organize it better. You know, uh, and hold people accountable, including black politicians accountable. So one of the things I struggle with in the thing you're tackling is the was was um, Du Bois and how he treated Ida B. Wells. Is the problem class, or is the problem gender? What's, what's, what was the problem with him? Was it age? Was it age? I mean, it was, I, I couldn't sleep at night. That was I know, you, you I had trouble. <laughs> I, I know, uh, I, I'm very good friends with, uh, W.B. Du Bois' biographer, David Lippert Lewis. And I said, after I researched this, so I said, David, I said, Du Bois wasn't even Du Bois until about 1930, <laughs> when he went to the left, you know, when he became Marxist, then he became a little bit. But he was a horrible person. I mean, okay, that's <laughs> that, I mean, that's so, that's, 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 that's
not scholarly. <laughs> he was to get along. He, he was a very difficult, you know, they call I a difficult, but he was difficult. And, um, and I think with art, I think this is one of the things. Remember, he's younger than I, Wells. When Ida Wells is in the middle of an anti lynching campaign going across the country to British Isles, he's still uh, studying in Germany. He comes back sort of wanting to get involved in stuff. And I kind of figuratively sort of taps him on the head. He says, well, you know, he seems to be okay. I guess we can let him. He wanted to be a part of a group. She was a kid. But I guess we'll let him. Yeah, I guess it would be okay. So she was a little, you know, that was upsetting to him. Because he was a snob. He was really a snob. Uh, and then later on, uh, he is more he is more conservative than she was. Uh, and she's always upsetting the apple cart. And it's sort of embarrassing people who are moderate. Uh, so, uh, he, and, let me get to also to the most important thing, is that the NAACP and Ida compete over the issue of lynching. Ida is trying to get the NAACP, she's a founder. Now, as you know, that's what you're alluding to, he tried to keep her out of the founding party. And it's white to get her back in. <laughs> Uh, uh, and uh, and he claims because he wanted somebody else from the Niagara movement to be there, be one of the forty, and that she he thought would be represented. I don't belong to an interracial. This is very interesting. Interracial women's organization called the Frederick Douglass Club. It's an interracial, and the and the, and the head of it was a white woman, much to Ida's despair. But that's another question. Head was a white woman. And so the boy said, Well, I thought that white woman could represent you too. <laughs> so, uh, so that's how it begins. And then she's in complete competition with the NAACP all the time. Because the NAACP is so respectable that if you were, they wouldn't defend you unless you were really just you know, pure. <laughs> uh, and she was a grassroots person. She believed in organizing from the grassroots up. NAACP was top down. So they'd be involved in some of the same issues, incidents. And Ida would also compete with them by raising money. <laughs> and the NAACP was always involved in something where they were matching funds by whites. Right? So if they couldn't raise money, they couldn't get the matching funds. And Ida was raising money <laughs> from black people. It was just a mess. So, um, but they really took over the, the uh, from the very beginning, Ida Wells wanted the NAACP to, to, use its, to use its resources for a federal amendment against lynching. The NAACP demurred. They thought that it was unconstitutional and that they didn't want to get involved with it. But then eventually they find out this is really what is what our black people's minds. And they can't get a legitimate group of people behind them. People didn't trust the NAACP until they begin to take on the issue of lynch. Then they begin to trust them. And then black women come into the NAACP, which really makes it what became the good organization that came later. Uh, but but once the NAACP takes over lynching, then they marginalize Ida. So, and that's the voice. So, I'm sorry, it was a long-winded sort of indirect answer. Well, this is a short, short question with a very short answer, I think. Oh, um, I'll try. And it has to do with, with uh, anti-lynching legislation. So she spent great deal of her life, and all of her life, trying to get that legislation. Have we ever passed legislation? And how long ago did we pass it? March 2022. How long ago did we pass it? March 2022. 
It was March, March 2022. This year. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And even then, and even, you know, the legislation isn't always strong. But at least it's there symbolically. Yeah. So the question is. It's there symbolically. They just couldn't do it. They tried to get the, they tried to, she tried to, not either, she was dead, but they tried to get the, tried to get the RNA passage. Now there were anti, there was anti-lynching laws within some states, uh, including Illinois, because she was, because she got it done. And also in Ohio, she worked with uh, Harris Smith, a newspaper editor, to get it in Ohio. Uh, but yeah, but the federal couldn't get it. They tried very hard. My question, hi, I'm Diane, and I'm Dr. Gibbs. I have a. Uh, a supplementary question to his because it did not pass into where, where are you? I'm right here. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, the legislation did not pass until the Emmett Till federal lynching yeah, law yes. became a federal yeah. crime, hate crime or something like March 29th, 2022 okay. or March 30th. The uh -huh. question that I had is, in your opinion, why did it take so long? Did it fall off the table? Did people stop talking about it? It certainly didn't stop happening. But why do you think it literally took 70, 80 years to get that to pass? You, you could never move to the South. Southern legislators was the primary thing, primary reason. And, but, but, but listen, you know, we tend to be also put too much of a burden on the, on the South as well. because. Northerners were pretty problematic. You couldn't get legislators to do it. I guess in, in some sense that, that makes sense, right? Like, if you can't win the Civil War, then you just hold on to the one linchpin you have, which is don't pass it. Um, but in this country, it would have taken white people to vote in agreement with that bill. I just can't imagine that it took, you know, 70 years. This is probably an unsatisfactory answer to your question. But fundamentally, this is a country where it's always been divided by people who think pe pe blacks and others should have rights. And then there's the other people who think that rights should only be among a certain, certain groups. That's always been the that's always been the struggle, right? And so uh, uh, the people who don't think, because anti-lynching legislation empowers people, empowers the wrong people, right? And then those who just don't, don't, don't agree with that. So you always have that, that, that issue that you have to deal with that, that's there. Because they're all, we, see, we see it, we see it now. We, it's, it's kind of, it's not, it's more complicated than this, but you see that in the Democrats and Republicans. Who wants people to have, right? It's not even just that. It's people who think that the best thing for the country is, there's a group who says the best thing for the country is for everyone to have rights. There are others who believe the best thing for the country is that if rights are limited for certain groups. And the ones who are, and the, 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 the people who have talked about limitations <laughs> have won a lot of these wars. You're right. Um, I guess my next thought is, do you believe that the passing of this anti-lynching bill was sort of the peace offering for not passing the revised voting reel? The voting yeah, act? I'm sorry. Do you believe this might have been like the peace offering from our government officials as to why they wouldn't pass the voting right revised act. So they thought, well, we won't give you the right to vote, but we'll throw you this bone? I, I would assume so. I don't, I mean, I can't say that I know that. No, um, we don't know. Right, 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 but, right. I, but, I, but I, I assume so. It came at a moment uh, when there was, some uh, people felt the necessity for some appeasement. Thank you. Is, yes. 
is there a good quality documentary on the life and the influence of Ida B. Wells? You would know, or is there one in the making? Sure. Is there a good quality documentary on the life and the influence of Ida B. Wells, or is there one in the making now? There are a number of documentaries on Wells. Uh, my favorite, though, is even though it's kind of, and, they, and there are documentaries where there's segments on Wells. Uh, my favorite, one, the, the first one was done uh, in the 70s and the 70s by Passion for Justice in the 80s by William Greaves, who was a brilliant documentarian and who, you know, didn't have, at that point, didn't have very much uh, at his disposal, but who just created. You feel the, the atmosphere, and you feel her. But he also did something that was very brilliant in that documentary, which is he got Toni Morrison to read from the autobiography. And Toni is very dramatic. Toni is a wonderful reader, you know, and, and understated, but just riveting. <laughs> uh, and, um, and, I, and that's it. And, and it was the first time, and some of it looks a little dated now by today's standards, but I still think, um, I mean, the technology is a little dated, uh, but I still think that's, that's one of the best docu the documentaries. I still think that one's too classy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm interviewed in that one in those the 80s. And I, I, played, I, played the, I played it to my class once, and someone said, Oh, look, there's a young guy with the games up there. <laughs> <laughs> so now I play it legal room. <laughs> Sojourner Truth or Fannie Lou that she could have chose. And I'm just interested on why her, like why did she grab your attention? What made you want to look into her and really research her life? It's a, it's a great question. Uh, the, the, all the all these have been great questions, by the way. Thank you. The, um, there was something I, I intuited about her before I even intellectualized. When she sort of came into my vision, there was something that I felt that I would, as I, so, as I mentioned earlier, the things I wanted to understand, um, I mean, my, my intellectual vision has always been, ever since a young person, since, so, since, I was a young person since, since even, I can tell you exactly since the Freedom Rides in the 19th century, was to try to understand the power of this thing called race, the power to create such hatred, hmm. and the power to create such heroism. You know? And, I remember, and that, that question came to me when I was watching the Freedom Riders young people your age who got on these buses to go south and who would be met by snarling racists who bombed the buses, pulled people out, hit people with tire irons. Uh, you know, the core of conservation quality who thought up freedom rides wanted to cancel them because it was so violent. And the young people said, Oh no, they start writing all the bills. We're not going to let be defeated by this. And they got back on those buses. And I was like 13 at the time. I was like, I said, what is this? First of all, I had never thought about anything that I would die for. And then I was trying to figure out, well, especially the, the, the faces of those white people that I hatred. I said, what, what is this? And 
so it's always been sort of the quest of, uh, and, and, and of course, racism, is, of course, is intersected with gender. And, I mean, it's all part of the same uh, thing. And so, really, and I thought about this afterwards, not when I started, first started researching her. I said, well, well, who else can tell me more about <coughs> hatred, about race, and its hatred, and its heroism, than someone who starts the anti-lynching campaign, right? <laughs> so, you know, so I was hoping, I sort of, I was hoping, I said, I, uh, you know, it was hard because I said, man, can I deal with this? Uh, and I got great advice, Tony Morrison was a friend, and I got great advice by Tony, I said, Tony, you know, because he doesn't love it, huh? I said, Tony, how do you, how do you keep your mind sort of right writing about these difficult, painful subjects. And she said, well, she said, you know what? You have to negotiate with your characters. You have to say, you know what? I'll come in there with you, but you gotta let me out. <laughs> and you gotta, and you gotta negotiate. You have to, you know, say, yeah, look. I said, I don't go in there with you, but you gotta let me out, let me out, you know. Uh, so, uh, and, that, and, that, and that was it, and, and I, I think I learned, you know, I learned what I needed, to, she taught me what I needed to know at that time. That's the one final It's our last question from online. Uh, um, Amaya says, okay, we'll take that one. Amaya says, Dr. Giddings, as a young adult in America, what can I do with my voting rights to try and change the world as Ida B. Wells did? Also, thank you so much for teaching me so much about her. Oh, well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, there, is, there are, it's what I've said in, in the, I think, in, 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 in the past. Understand what the vote really means. Understand the history of, of voting, voting rights. Understand what Fannie Lou Hamer did. Understand what I did. Understand and read them. Read why they were willing to die for the vote. From the, I mean, it's, it is incredible of what they thought, because it, oh, it, 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 that's what freedom meant to people, to many of them, right? And they are, and they are being, they're in these, and some of these people, I know Hamish in this little Mississippi town, being beaten and going right back up. So read them and understand what they felt uh, about the vote. And understand, though, what it really means. It's not just, you know, pushing a lever for a person. It's ex exercising, it's a part of exercising your free will and your voice. But you have to do more. I mean, I hate the word do even more than that. But you have to understand what you're voting for and why you're voting for it, you know? And the work begins, the, the voting is, is the first thing you do, it's not the last thing you do. But you also understand what's going on beforehand. Um, but, uh, so, and once you do that, it's just very empowering and you'll never not vote again. Once you understand all that, you'll never, you'll never not, you'll never not vote. So please, so exercise those rights, but, but exercise them with intelligence and with knowledge, and with understanding. You know, and once you have that baby, you're gone, it's gone. Um, good evening, my name is Rihanna. Hi. My question goes back to the respectability that you were talking about yes, earlier. Yes, no, I didn't answer that, did I? Go ahead. Um, <laughs> why is it that it, the concept of like, respectability and like the whole model minority myth was so strong, and it took like a lynching of a personal acquaintance to help mobilize Ida. 
okay, why was respected and why it existed, why what it was, and why it existed. Why was it so strong that, okay. Uh, respectability, though, this is important. It's a very important question. It is more than, respectability is more than like snobbery or just being a good person or, you know, not making waves. It's more than that. Remember, black people uh, have been thought of as, you know, less than human, with less, with not having any ability to do any of those things, without having the ability to, 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 to become educated, to become citizens, to become, be able to behave in such a way. And it's really intense in the period following slavery, right, in the late 19th century. And I, and I, and I mentioned with the social sciences, the modern social sciences of, of scientific inferiority. And this is happening at a time, it's not only the social sciences, but now the technology has allowed these views to go from coast to coast in minutes. Right? So, acting a certain way and achieving certain things through wealth, for example, and education, was, was also proof that blacks were equal, that they were human, that they had capacities. And this, you say, well, it's horrible to have to prove that. Yeah, it is horrible, but you have to prove it in order to get the vote one <laughs> day, or in order, you know, uh, to have certain kinds of opportunities, et cetera. So respectability was a civil rights issue. What to them? So it was intense, and it wasn't just, you know, looking down on people because they weren't the same class and all that kind of stuff. I mean, there was some of that, but, but it, was a, it was a much deeper issue than that. What Ida, though, figures out is that all that is fine, but respectability is not an agent of change. Nothing changes with that, you know? And she was, and she stayed pretty, you know, respect, she, you know, was had a certain, like as you mentioned, Victorian herself. But she understood that, that behavior had its place. And that she had to protest, because a lot of the things that was anti-protest, it was because it was anti-respect. Right? And especially for a woman to do these things, and to be talking about violence and rape. I was one of the few uh, journalists who even used the word rape. Most people say one was outraged or all these other, you know. But she was very direct and she was the first one to stop, you know, a lot of that 19th century classical language. She was very direct. She didn't she stopped all that. She was like, this is this is the deal. Right. Uh, and so so, but she, but that took great courage to leave that, what was called true womanhood, right, around those respectable notions. And remember, respectability also was thought to protect you. Once you fell from respectability, then you're vulnerable to all kinds of, you know, predation. <coughs> But she had the courage to sort of leave that notion enough, right? To be direct about telling the truth to power and to understand and to tell the blacks what the New Deal is. That, that old social, that social contract was gone, right? This is a modern age, economic competition, et cetera. So, so that, and that was her brilliance as a social thinker, not just as an activist. And this is why I say she understands the country in a way that most people do not. That. So yes, so respectability was important in its own way. But I just says it's not gonna change nothing. There was nobody more respectable than Thomas Moss. Who had who ended up being shot and tortured to death. Gee, what a number. <laughs>